and something broke the surface of the water off to my left and I remember I kind of glanced over real quick and what I saw was a smallmouth darting up and then what he was chasing was a crayfish that had broken the surface while it was uh, fleeing him and was just darting all over the place and broke the surface like twice while that smallmouth was trying to get him. And that was something that just kind of like lodged into my brain. It's demo days, plan on filming this in the morning, got super busy. Here we are at four in the afternoon. It's almost over, we're having fun. Beers have been consumed, everyone's having a great time. Um, we're here with James Hughes. Hi. Um, a very good friend of ours, a Schultz Outfitters staff member, head guide, guy that kinda turns the dials and makes sure everyone's having success and having a good time on the river and everybody's getting put in the right position to have the most enjoyable day on the water. So, big responsibility for this guy. Oh, yeah. Um, but not only does he guide and not only does he figure out what's going on with the guides and get everybody in a good position, but he also ties a lot of really good flies. And honestly, from the heart, this is true. This is the most dynamic fly to come out of the Midwest in a minute and uh, I've been able to take advantage of it and fish it and do my thing with it and uh, you guys should all know about it so uh, flea and cray if you ain't tying it if you're not fishing it you need to be um, James it started here yes yeah this thing that little ratty thing you got some ipsy possum on here <laughs> that's right I found off a dead one in, on Forest Street yep not much you know, no, most just to say, this is like maybe a quick scissor clip off the uh, off yeah. the rump. This is pretty. <laughs> it's basic. pretty ready, yeah. So she's out, and then yep. now we're to this madness. Gone from there to there. Yep, that's just it. Crazy. So I know what this does on the water. Mm -hmm. You obviously know what it does on the water, but let's hear it from the guy who invented it. Yeah. So what? It. Where do you want to start with that? Like, do we want to tell the story of the fleeing? We can do the whole story. The story. Give yeah. It, give it to us. Give so, us the uh, two-minute version. Two-minute version. It's going to be six, but that's fine. I'll give you the two. This, the first one started, uh, I was actually running just a half-day float on the stretch river by the shop here, and I had pulled over and anchored just downstream of uh, Forest Street, and there's a just kind of a hole there. And something broke the surface of the water off to my left, and I remember I kind of glanced over real quick, and what I saw was a smallmouth darting up, and then what he was chasing was a crayfish that had broken the surface while it was uh, fleeing him, and was just darting all over the place and broke the surface like twice while that smallmouth was trying to get him. And that was something that just kind of like lodged into my brain, thought about it, didn't really apply anything, flash forward a couple seasons, had some low water, crayfish bite was on, everything with weight on it at all, you just couldn't fish it. You were just digging into the weeds. And so I kind of went home, whipped up this little nothing bug, um, just on a single <clears throat> hook with a stack heel inside of it. Um, kind of more zoo cougary in its uh, initial appearance, but a couple of uh, rabbit legs, bunch of rubber, flank over the back, few few wraps of rabbits and possum with a glow bug bling head and that was just enough to keep it above the weeds while still swimming and that worked pretty well but didn't fish it a ton here there um, ended up coming out of that going I want that same thing but more and so over the winter had like a kind of a second version of this that had the articulation that uh, this fly ended up having but it was still in these kind of more plain clothes. Um, and then I remember showing that to him and he said, like, it's, you got something, but let's, you know, you keep, keep working at it. And then I just, one winter started playing around with these brushes. we got the lively leg brush in and that's when it, uh, it kind of jumped off for me. Cause that added the rubber that I was looking for without just stacking in more and more rubber legs unnecessarily. Cause with that brush, it's just, as you wrap it, it's just spinning them in. Um, and that's how the current version got to its place. So 
that's the, the, the quick and the dirty story of the flea and cray and how it came to be. So let's take that fly. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> let's start at the rear. Okay. And let's work forward and maybe along the way, like throw in a couple things that we've flipped around and changed and tweaked over the years. Sure. So uh, with the rear, honestly, the, the rear doesn't have a ton of engineering into it. Like it's just a few materials, but one important thing is to keep the, uh, the claws, which are either pine squirrel or mink is kind of one of the more recent developments. Keep them to that. Like there's a reason I dropped the rabbit that was in the original. It was too much weight back there and it, it deadened the swim. And so when I thinned it out by adding the pine squirrel, less leather, less hair, still had all the same movement, that really helped. Um, using the, uh, oh, what do they call this now? It's not sexy floss anymore. <clears throat> It's just, it? it's, it's made by Montana fly company and it's a play off the sexy floss. Okay. Yeah. What well, I can't remember what the heck it's called, but, um, those rubber legs are better than your standard flat rubber. They got that like little, little bit of a twist to them. Um, or round yeah, or, just, or round. And yeah. it just seems like it takes water and lasts a lot longer. It does. So it's, as long it's as you very, don't get piked, it's very durable, but also keeping those things long rather than short that adds a lot to the swim. It just adds almost like an extra rudder or a little bit of like an extra weight in the back to help turn the fly. Slash. A lot of slash to it, especially if you keep those long. If you shorten them too much, you lose it. The other deal with it is just using smaller flanks on that rear, just like we've got here, and just a light coat of that flex resin. You, you kind of have those components into that rear shank and you're good to go. Uh, the other thing with the rear shank, it needn't be super long. It also doesn't have to be super short. So like a, a 15 to a 20 mil shank is, is more Perfect. than enough, even on the big ones. Um, but that's that's kind of the story for the rear shank. And then moving forward, you know, I, I get a lot of questions about like, why not two hooks? Well, this fly doesn't really need two hooks. They garbage the heck out of it as it is. Mm -hmm. I do have two hooked versions that are quite a bit <clears throat> larger. They're about almost double that length. They have their time and place, but this is your daily driver, that single hook. And when they eat it, they they're they don't hesitate. They come in and they kill it. Right. Let's let's touch on ARX TP six fifty versus ARX TP six ten and the difference in the swim. Two swim. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's straight eye versus bend, correct? Yep. 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 So the straight eye that we've got here, what that's gonna give you is more of a true side to side kind of gliding motion. Sometimes you gotta work it a little harder to get the exact swim that you want, but it is, I think, the more versatile fly to fish through a season if you've got the water for it. The six, uh, or the, the 26 degree bend. Um, 650. The 650. Which is the down. That's the down on Kinked. It. Yep, it's at a 26 degree, and that thing can actually dig. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the early season or want to get down a little more, it's not going to dig like crazy, but it will get down. You can work that thing down to about three feet without yep. much effort. And, and kind of also sort of like what you can do with a swinging D, you can cast that over submerged wood, work it down, and then work it up with a high rod tip, kind of climb up over the wood, and then drop it back down again. And so it's a very versatile fly. Um, I really like both. I think that the the down eye can be fished a little more easily by most folks out of the gate just because that that little bit of a bend it just adds that much more swim and gets that thing kicking a lot better this and thing and this like these flies the same thing that a lot of these flies doesn't matter if it's a plane fly or a swing and d or whatever but one of the things that i think people really need to just drive into their head is the work has been done at the vice Yes. So you don't need to put any extra snapping of the rod, weird stuff, 12 to 18 inches off the water, the proper angle, and just make the fly work. It's a lure. It is literally yeah. a lure. You just need to let it work, and it will work for you, and it'll, it'll, it'll catch fish. Yes. And then the other thing, too, is, you, you know, when it comes to just the, the way the fly itself works, um, I get questions regularly in the boat of uh it basically someone pointing out it doesn't jig yep it swims. Co correct it it swims it is not meant to jig 
It is not meant to be fished slow. It's an energetic thing. You, you should be actively engaged with watching this and fishing it. It should make you a little tired. And the other thing I got to point out to people is like, I, not once in my life have I seen a crayfish do, yeah. do this. Not once. You, you walk into your creek or the river and you start rolling rocks and what do you see? Boom, 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 boom. They're darting and they're you know, shifting back and forth, going from piece of cover to piece of cover. That's the same concept with this. It needs to look like a fleeing crayfish, hence the name. Right. So don't fall into this. Like The, the jig is certainly a trigger for a, a bite, but there's a reason that this has a high percentage rate on closing deals with fish, and it's because it is doing the thing that the crayfish does, which is erratically flee. And like I said in the beginning, the, the whole idea with this came from me watching a crayfish break the surface while fleeing the, a smallmouth. So they will do everything they can to live, including attempting to leave the water. <laughs> so right. you can be as erratic and aggressive as you want with this thing. As long as you pause it, when the time is right, the fish will eat it. So we're working from, we got the rear, we got the shank, we got a connection, which could be a basic wire. Yeah. If you want to go super old school, you could go 20 pound maxima. If you want to go cutting shanks, you yep. could go senyo shank, trout shank, Whatever. 27, 17, yep. cut it down, connect it. You have a fly that will never fall apart. Now you're on to the front, we're on the hook, we're on a TP610, we're on a TP650. Right. Moving through that. You've got eyes, you've got rattle, you've got uh, more uh, H2O uh, lively leg brush. Yep. And then we'll move into the head. Yeah, so <clears throat> once you got the lively leg brush, you kind of, you got to get the carapace built. Uh, this one's got a good one. Um, with the mallard flank, you can mix and match as necessary. Uh, I like doing the same thing where you kind of run some lighter ones on the side, a darker one on top. Just mix it up. You know, if you actually dig in and look at what crayfish uh, crayfish look like in the Great Lakes region, there's like a whole bunch of different types, a whole bunch of different colors. This kind of like more uh, multicolored motif is not far off from plenty of the ones that exist when you really start digging into it. And the carapace itself does serve a purpose that does help it slash better in the water because it's just it creates a slicker surface over all that rubber leg. No drag. No drag. Um, Having that rabbit in there behind it, I do believe that building that bulk in that head serves for a better swim in the long run. Um, this is not a new feature in swim flies. This is a tried and true type of deal. Um, and then when it comes to the true head itself, that crustaceous brush is the thing that makes it. 100%. If you don't have that, it will not swim as well. That density of the material coupled with the rubber that's blended in and then trimming it as such right? Flat on the top, flat on the bottom. Yep. Um, that does help the swim. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be like razor treated, but just a good close cut with a good pair of sharp scissors. And then you treat that stuff down with, uh, with that flex cure resin. Yeah. Raid zap flexes money. Pick your poison. Yep. But yeah, that raid zap stuff rocks. And, and that, that kind of creates like, if, if you're thinking of the crayfish, that's almost that that curled rear, that sh that shell that they're they're kicking underneath them to dart and, and move. So that's the idea behind that. The one thing about the head is don't be afraid to trim down like this. Do be afraid to leave too much. Right. It's better with a thinner profile because that again allows you to cut. Now that being said, especially with the with the rabbit there. That extra bulk is needed coupled with that keel in order to get this thing to like slow down in the water and then the uh, that keel will keep it and turn it. So that's what's going to impart all that action. You need both. If it's unkeeled, it's garbage. Mm -hmm. Okay? You did it wrong. Yep. Um, that keel has to be there. When you're tying, do you put the keel on at the vise or do you put the keel on on the water? Personally, I put it on at the vise. I do too. Yeah. Because like you know what it needs. Exactly. For this fly, I put it on at the vise and I take care of it. I make sure it's going to be there. Yeah. So, you know, I'm tying it in, curing it in, doing all the work for this pattern especially because it is a true swim fly. I'm not, I'm not looking for a whole lot of tweaks. There are ways you can tweak this thing for different scenarios. And you may not be fishing, like in this particular case, the down eye all year. You might switch to the straight eye or 
like a uh, like the the mini version here, which still has a keel on it, but it stays much higher up and it's easier to control. Right. So great the, low water fly, low clear, even sight fishing if you really want to have a guy that wants yep. to really dial in on that. It's fantastic. It works, <laughs> it very, works well. very well. Yeah. So and that 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 travels across all angling, like just the whole crayfish deal. It's like it's it's a preferred. <laughs> if not no one food source for the smallmouth bass if a crayfish is in the area they're gonna and eat that it. thing puts eyes on it it's getting dusted yeah yeah you know we could keep it real basic and just go standard and we get a good looking standard so you got like would you consider this standard you're talking 1020 on your yeah hooks? that's pretty standard right yep. there so 1020 610 or 650 eric's that's your standard issue i would say overall length Four and a half, five inches with all the stuff. Yep. You know, with everything, main fly, three and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's going on there. And then this is a single hook with one shank off the back. You got some mono eyes on there for realistic purposes. And then if you want to go with the, uh, where's that? This is one right here. You want to go with the finesse or mini. Mini was what we're going to coin it. We're going to call it the mini flea and cray. Mm -hmm. um, you got a single hook on the back. Uh, Eric's Gamorous or Eric's Gamorous Salt, depending on how you want to do it, how hard you want to set the hook. We got you covered. Um, but a very nice wide gap hook, very short shank attached to a 25 or longer. Yep. Uh, front shank and very similar tie. Uh, we may have one. Is there one on YouTube for the mini? I don't know if we ever did one. No, we should mm -hmm. do a mini one of these days. Mm -hmm. And cut all that out but anyways uh, a more compact version you know seven weight friendly very um let's talk a little bit about this and like how it came about and why you would opt for this over this which clearly is larger yeah so the the mini came about real fast where it was a honestly it came about more as a uh my own approach and i was just thinking more about um fishing for trout to be totally honest. So mm -hmm. like just the way trout eat where they tend to grab more from the rear rather than, you know, smallmouth who are almost hundred percent headshot. Uh, so I was like, well, you, I don't feel like I'm at a disadvantage having that hook in the back. Um, what I ended up finding was the nice thing that it's a smaller offering. When it came to the smallmouth, it didn't matter that the hooker was in the rear. They still got the whole thing. Um, and still found that trout enjoyed both sizes regardless. So it was sort of one of those ideas that I, I had a thought and acted on it and then found that it didn't matter either way. Both were successful in both arenas as a happy accident. Um, the cool thing about the mini is it opens up a lot more of your year to fishing this fly. Mm -hmm. So whereas this, in really low water, it can be a bit much and requires things like a intermediate line to get it down and really get it fishing. This mini doesn't like you can get away with this on a fluorocarbon leader and a floating line if you wanted to and you can kind of work those weed edges or depressions without really frightening them and you can even trim it down a little more than what we've got here should you choose to do so mm -hmm. um, so you can continue to downsize this fly it does still swim great uh, something to note for both flies again to just kind of like correct some of the old thinking about uh, crayfish patterns they all fish hook point down get a lot of questions about whether or not it fishes hook point up they all fish hook point down mm -hmm. and again since these things don't have a true jigging component you can still control their trajectory and place in the water through your own actions the, you know when you pause they're not plummeting um, so you can sort of glide them around things and work them up and over wood but this little mini one is it it's it's got a lot more, I would say, broad appeal to a season, and it's it's worth having a handful of these in the box at all times because they just they they get the job done. And it's a simpler pattern, honestly. It cuts out just a couple of steps. It's not too different from the big one, but it's just since it's just shorter, there's less material usage per fly. So mm -hmm. they do. Whereas this one might take me 25 minutes to tie, a full size might be more like 35. Or 40. Damn, we got to speed up, die. Dude, I like to drink a little bit when I'm tying. A little sip of whiskey. 
One rap at a time. Yeah. Exactly. Now you gotta take it sometimes. Exactly. That's it. One rap at a time. <laughs> <laughs> got a freaking song here. <laughs> All right. So let's talk a little bit. This thing's evolved. Obviously, we saw the beginning, and here we are at the final slash in process version, which is killer. Catches a lot of fish. One thing that I see when people tie this and throw it up on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, a lot of times you see rabbit for the legs. Let's talk a little bit of how important the pine squirrel is. And then now we've kind of had a new product come on the scene, which is mink that floats, naturally floats. Um, talk a little bit about the claws and the paws and how you can get that yeah. desirable. So with the claws, you want... You want that pine squirrel because it is thinner. It flows through the water nicer. It doesn't create as much drag on the back end of the train when you're trying to fish this thing. So that's why we go with the thinner pine squirrel. Now the mink, which this one is, the mink is a cool thing. So it's got basically the same dimensions as what your pine squirrel will have but it does have a little bit more of a floating property to it. So you've got a denser hair and so when that thing pauses, when you've got it on mink, you get a better kind of like splay up on that pause of those legs. So it'll just full on go defensive mode and up. So that's something that that mink that we just started using this spring really 100%. starts to, it, it just adds a little bit more nuance. Now, either or, yes, absolutely. If you like to kind of tweak things and experiment with things, mink's worth a shot. Um, it can certainly change the way your swim of the fly happens. But there's nothing wrong with pine squirrel. Nothing wrong but with pine squirrel. you would recommend not using rabbit. Do not use rabbit. Like I'd say, pine squirrel or mink, negatory on the rabbit. Get it out of your head that the claws need to be giant. This is an impressionistic approach to angling. All the great anglers take impressionistic approaches this is all like that's the guys that i watched high it is a it's impressionism at its finest it passes for a lot of things um and it's it's selling the idea of a crayfish it need not be an exact replica of a crayfish mm -hmm. so you don't need these giant honking claws hanging off the back just give them something that represents that same thing with the rubber legs representative of the antenna the mouth bits, if you will, and it also adds a little life to the uh, claws itself. So just sell the idea of a crayfish. Have it, you know, if you can squint your eyes and this thing passes as crayfish, that's a damn good start. And then beyond that, it just needs to move and behave like it in the water. Uh, my other idea was color. So let's just touch on the blends. You know, not like, I mean, the easiest way to think about this is I'm a fish. I'm mm -hmm. looking. I see this thing. I don't see that many colors. And it just looks like black and white, but not black and white, but pretty close to black and white from what I understand how fish see. Who knows? Right? It's not just one blob of yellow. It's not one blob yeah. of white. It's not one blob of orange. It's Whatever. A it's, mosaic. There you go. So, like, the importance of that and also quick touch on... The uh, client engagement factor of being able to see the fly totally. and how they're in it. They're in the game the whole time. And that is a huge part of the game because if you're not in the game and telling stories about how you went to Cancun last week, you ain't No one gives fish. a about Cancun. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's just, it's just, it's important because. Include that in the video. Because. <laughs> this is perfect. Yeah. You yeah. Keep, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta keep in yeah. the engagement game. is everything. So, engagement is everything. Uh, the colors, the blends, the blah, 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 the crustaceous, pound that home. That is the f brush. Don't tie some f brush on the front of this thing. Yeah. The crustaceous is what makes it swim. We haven't found anything else that has done what the crustaceous does. Nothing done. else does. All right. Let's talk a little bit about like what really blows my mind and clearly the fish's mind and gets them to just engulf this thing with zero hesitation is the color, the swim, all that stuff. But the blends, like what you can do with mallard, what you can do with the mink, what you can do with the pine, what you can do with the rabbit, what you can do with the crustaceous brush, and even the rubber legs. You can do all kinds of blends and crazy stuff going on. And what does the fish see? Why, beyond just the sick swim, the color scheme of these flies, you're able to do whatever you want. Yeah, so the, uh, you know, again, 
if you if you look at what the crayfish uh, that are in our area are, there's a whole bunch of different colors. And this kind of goes back to, you know, taking an impressionistic approach. I don't want to mimic just one particular species because on a given river there might be six or seven. And some of these things have like wild colors that you might not ever see because they're only coming out at night. They might live on the river banks but come into the river at the in the evenings. They they might just uh, dwell under rocks most of the day. You you don't know if you haven't actually gone in and looked or bothered to, to follow it up. So when it comes to color schemes, I'm not just doing boring browns and oranges. I'm doing a lot of olives, uh, pinks, light oranges, you know, various shades of oranges, blues, greens, everything in there I can fit. And with the rubber legs, the world is your oyster. There's a million colors of rubber legs out there. You can mix them in, you can blend them up. So on this fly alone, uh, we've got two different colors of rubber legs. We've got like an orange and black mixed in with like what looks like a light peachy pink kind of thing. The bonefish tan. Bonefish tan. The uh, lively leg brush. We got two different versions on here. We got the kind of like a tan and yellow with a tan and white. Uh, the rubber off the rear looks like it was originally. Uh, you got the the obligatory reds, and then you've got some light tans, which now have some awesome looking bleeding from the reds going into it, which there is no problem with that. That's just extra color, more trigger points, more things for them to see. So if you think about what the fish is looking at while they're in the water, they're not just seeing a solid color looking at that crayfish. We could get into what colors do they pick up, but that's not worth it because it doesn't really matter. If you are closely mimicking what the life form is, they will be picking up on those same patterns. That's really what it's all about. We can leave the debate of whether or not they see color aside completely. It's irrelevant. What we're trying to do, we see a crayfish as X. If we try to mimic X, they will pick it up like they pick it up. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to fill in as many odd colors as I can and just keep it going. Important thing to consider too, it's not always about the fish. A big thing with the fish, or fishing rather, is your own personal engagement with that fly while you're fishing. So I could tie one of these in a perfect, you know, rusty crayfish imitation, browns, oranges, and olives, and sit there and have you fish it, and it'll look awesome in the water, and you might catch some fish. But how useful is it if you can't track it coming through the column, and maybe three or four fish have eaten it, but you've only hooked one, for simplicity's sake? Mm -hmm. Not very useful. But you mix in some hot spots that bright orange, things that you can track and keep that fly within visual range for you, not only are you paying more attention to it, you're watching it, you're watching it eaten, seeing that fly disappear, you are fishing better as a result, mm -hmm. catching more fish at the end of the day. It's entertaining. It is. It's entertaining. Angling, Engagement is everything. <laughs> angling is merely entertainment at this point. You know, yeah. No one's feeding their family, going out on guide trips. It ain't happening unless you're out on a big lake. So this is just, it's for sport. You might as well have fun watching it if you can. Mm -hmm. If the day allows for it, watch your, watch your fly and enjoy the show. So that's something, and that's why even here, not a classic colored crayfish pattern, but you better believe that they eat it routinely. And the angler can see it. It behaves like a cray. It's an impression of a cray. You make it do the, the movements and the correct motions in the right time of year. You could pass this off as a molting thing. It doesn't really matter. This color gets eaten just as violently as a more classic color combination. It really doesn't make that much of a difference. There's a reason that Rapala sells all of those uh, lures in a million different colors. I've never seen a fire tiger bait fish, <laughs> but they eat fire tiger day in and day out. There's a reason it sells. It's not all just for fishermen. At a certain time, it behaves like a minnow. We're going to eat it, and it caught my eye in certain conditions. No different here. So having a wide variety of colors to offer and then just selling it like a crayfish needs to be sold, which is, you know, fleeing from predation, being jittery, panicky, and darting from spot to spot, that is key. That's the big deal with this thing. So... Go ahead and mix in, like even on this one, you got bits of chartreuse in there. Why not? There's no problem with that, okay? 
It's just one extra thing. I would rather offer more features to the fish than less. Just in the case that that chartreuse is the one thing that tips them over from being semi-interested to committed. Um, so don't be shy with any of these things when it comes to blending and mixing in different colors.